Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for our very last masterclass of the week. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the previous masterclasses uh, as well. This is the first time for us uh, and something that I think we'll be doing very much in the future. Uh, tonight, uh, we've got a very special guest. Um, so I'd like to say a massive thank you to Mr. Alistair Perbrick. Uh, today, he's going to be joining us uh, as the CEO and Chief Winemaker uh, of Tabilk as well. Uh, today, we're going to be tasting, uh, we're going through the magic of aged wines um, and actually tasting the feature museum pack that we're offering today as well. So it's a really special pack and uh, really grateful for Alistair for joining us as well today. Alistair, how are you going? Good. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. No problem. Glad you're here. Happy to have you. Um, now, guys, uh, just a little housekeeping as well. Um, if you're watching this on the replay uh, or live, please leave a comment, uh, like, react, emoji, uh, like, um, and, and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to answer those at the end of the show. Um, now, as well, make sure you watch until the end. Um, we've got a very special, pro uh, a very special something something at the end. Uh, so make sure you stay, uh, and uh, I promise it'll be good. Um, all right. Now, um, firstly, um, Alistair, if you could uh, do us a favour and, and tell us a little bit about yourself first. Give us an introduction about yourself and then we'll talk a bit about the brand Tarbilk. Oh, it's a long time since anyone's asked me about, about myself and my, my winemaking career. Uh, so, uh, obviously, I was, I was brought up on the property, um, so uh, I've been around to Bilk all my life. Uh, school in Melbourne and then uh, decided to head over to Rosewood, the Agricultural College, which was the only place then in Australia that you could do uh, winemaking. Uh, so graduated from Roseworthy, moved out into the industry for a few years. I was very happy to get some experience uh, and knowledge at someone else's expense and uh, started in Coonawarra at the old Mildara Wines, which is now part of Treasury Wine Estates. I uh, did a little stint over at Hungerford Hill, which is now Australian Vintage. Uh, and then ultimately returned home uh, in the middle of 1978 to take up my winemaking duties there. Yep. Excellent. So you've been on ever since, 78? Uh, ever since 78, yep. So my, my first vintage was 1979. Wow, that's incredible. That's incredible. And uh, Tarbilk as well. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Tarbilk is the oldest family-owned winery in Victoria. Is that correct? Yeah, so Tabilk started uh, back in 1860. Uh, we, we were trying desperately last year to celebrate our 160th anniversary, but the coronavirus got in the way of that three times, so we still yeah. haven't celebrated it, and now we're in our 161st year. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, we're the oldest uh, family-owned winery and vineyard in, in Victoria. And uh, for those uh, that don't know where we're located, uh, we're right in the middle of Victoria in a beautiful region called Nagambi Lakes. Now, Nagambi Lakes, so that's probably not um, such a prominent region. Uh, of course, Tarbilk is a really popular brand, uh, but people don't typically look uh, you know, around for Nagambi Lake wine. So um, tell us a bit about the region itself and, and why you love working with their wines and why the, the fruit there is so incredible. Yeah, well, Nagambi Lakes is a very small region. It's only about 35,000 acres, uh, but it is very unique in, its, in that it's the only Australian wine region and one of only eight that we know of in the world where the climate is dramatically influenced by inland water mass. Uh, and what that inland water mass does is cools uh, our growing season and allows us to grow much higher quality grapes than you would actually expect in this part of the world. So for anyone that hasn't been to Tabilk, if you do come, the first thing you're going to see as you enter the property is lots of water. Uh, most of our vineyards are on islands. Uh, it's a, um, unless you're up in a helicopter, you don't sort of get uh, But uh, there is just lots of water. Uh, we've got about 12 kilometres of Goulburn River frontage, uh, eight kilometres of a, an Anna branch that comes off the Goulburn and re-enters the Goulburn and off that Anna branch there's a whole lot of backwaters and billabongs and lagoons so it's really pretty uh, and lots of wildlife uh, and so you know people can uh, really really enjoy uh, getting back to nature when they come and visit us. Yeah awesome yeah. awesome uh, it's such a unique region I feel like and uh, I think 
We're going to explore these wines in a moment, um, but I'm really excited to see how these wines have aged uh, over time as well. Um, now, Alistair as well, um, could you maybe just give me a little bit of insight to your family history too? So 160 years, like that's, that's a very long time. Um, tell us how it all started. Well, I can't boast that my family established to milk. Uh, we, we didn't. Uh, we bought the property, or my great-grandfather bought the property in 1925. But interestingly, we were able to trace back uh, to one of the underground cellars that was excavated in 1875 by a fellow called James Perbrick. And as it turns out, uh, he, he is a family member. So although we can't trace ownership right back to the beginning, at least we can trace uh, some, uh, some involvement, if you like, uh, back to 1875. Uh, so my great-grandfather purchased to Bilk in 1925. Uh, he wanted to split it up and break it up into dairy blocks because of all the water that was around. Right. And it was my grandfather who was studying law and accountancy at Cambridge University who fell in love with the property when he visited with his father immediately after purchase and then spent the next number of years convincing his dad not to sell <laughs> the uh, property and break it up into dairy farms, but to actually uh, allow the winery to continue uh, as, as it was. Uh, he right. ultimately convinced his father to do that, but there was one very important proviso. That was that grandfather had to come out from England and run it. <laughs> so, so, yeah, right. so he did. So he did, and he arrived in 1931 with my father, who was one at the time, Jeez. my grandmother. And uh, and then set about the restoration and the fortunes of Tabilk. Awesome! That's so, such an incredible story. And uh, you know, again, this is a brand with so much history as well. So, thanks for for the insight into into kind of how it all came about. Um, look, I, I think maybe the viewers are a little bit sick of us talking. Why don't we have a look at some of these wines? Um, how about we start with the 2012 museum release Marsan. I think this mm -hmm. would be a good one to start with. Let me just show this one to the camera so the viewers can get a bit of a look here. Great. Now, 2012 Marsan. I can see, by the way, I don't know if the camera can see this. Can you maybe just zoom back in on it? That's a lot of gold medals on that wine. Must be a superstar. <laughs> now, I haven't tried this one before, um, but the 2012 Marsan, could you maybe just give a bit of insight to the viewers on, you know, how maybe a fresh Marseille might differ from something that's got, you know, nearly 10 years age on it? Sure. Well, let's let's just backtrack one step. So the first thing that uh, all the viewers need to know is that whenever they try a to build wine, it's made, they know it's made from grapes grown on the estate. So we're 100% estate grown, estate made, estate bottled. So we have control over every step of the operation, but all, importantly, being 100% estate grown means uh, that there is a, that sense of place uh, in, in the, in the flavours. You know, it's a very much terroir driven. So, so we're, we're very, you know, we're very pleased, particularly for a winery of our size, that we've been able to maintain that estate grown ethos. So as far as Marsan is concerned, we've been growing it at Tabilk since the 1860s, would you believe? Uh, no. I've got no idea why the earlier managers planted Marsan. It's a Cocteron variety. Uh, it doesn't make good sherry. It doesn't make good uh, fortified wine. And that was the, the wines that were selling back in those days. Uh, but planted they did. Uh, it then was wiped out by Phylloxera in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And grandfather, when he returned to Tabilk, uh, instructed that Marsan be replanted. I asked him why uh, when he was alive, and he couldn't answer the question. It, it just seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> so, so we're very pleased that he did give that instruction. Uh, and yep. so our oldest Marsan vineyard now dates back to 1927, which is one of the oldest vineyards in the world. In fact, as far as we know, the second oldest in the world, the oldest in Australia. And really? we've got about 100 yeah. acres of Marsan, which is the single biggest holding of that variety in the world. Uh, so the way we, we make the wine when it's young, obviously we're looking at an older wine here tonight, uh, but uh, we, we make the wine because it's very lightly fruited uh, by uh, using all of the modern techni 
techniques that are available. So we've got stainless steel refrigeration, tank presses, you name it. Uh, and the whole idea is to exclude oxygen from the whole winemaking process so that we maximise flavour. So if we had a young Marsan in front of us, we would expect that there would be citrus, lime, uh, maybe some melon fruit, uh, maybe some tropical fruits, uh, mm -hmm. all wrapped around uh, with a lovely minerality, uh, similar mm -hmm. to what you get from young Hunter Semion and uh, young Rieslings from places like Clear Valley, Eden Valley and so on. So yep. unoaked white wine, uh, it's got a very high acid backbone as a youngster, which means that uh, that's going to help it with its cellaring potential. And then we fast forward to tonight to look at this 2012, so it's nine years old, uh, right. and we can see how those fresh fruits have now developed into uh, a more uh, honeysuckle, toasty sort of style. Uh, a lot of people think the toastiness is oak, but it's not. It's, it's actually aged fruit flavour. Uh, right. and, and it's still got that minerality, though, that wraps around the wine. So it's, it's uh, broadening out a little bit in the middle, and certainly... Uh, older Marsans like this can match up with a, a lot more food than young Marsans can. And uh, I, I particularly like having, you know, five to ten year old Marsans with Asian food, uh, with any of the white meats, with pork dishes, uh, spicy dishes. You know, it goes, it goes really well. Yeah, excellent. And uh, now you've also made a purposeful decision as well to hold these back and then release them, you know, down the track as a museum release. Um, now, uh, are there any specific re you know, reasons for this or is this um, just how you prefer your Marsan and, and, and how, um, you know, you picture it to be in its, in its prime? Well, uh, well uh, for me, Marsan is best drunk with a bit of age on it, but I don't expect that consumers are going to have the patience for the yeah. most part to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. We, we made a decision of... 25 years ago, that we would keep about 20 or 25% of the total vintage production back and ultimately re-release it as a uh, museum release. And sometimes we might do uh, two or three museum re-releases of the same wine um, as, as we're seeing tonight. So the first museum re-release is usually when it's about five or six years of age, and then we yep. might do it when it's 10 and, and sometimes even when it's 15 years of age. You know, it's all part of educating people around particularly white wine that there are some white wine styles that you can sell with confidence and they actually improve and get better with confidence. So we're just selling, we're doing the hard work and the hard yards and uh, we're selling it for everyone but still making it available. Absolutely, especially in this uh, age of uh, instant gratification. I think, uh, I think people would really appreciate that you're kind of holding this stuff back until it's right where it needs to be. Um, let's have a bit of a taste, shall we? Yep. So you can Rob, already can you smell the toast, sort of... the honey on there, and the colour is just amazing, just this pure golden colour as well. The other, the other technology advantage too with, with white wines generally, but with Marsan particularly, uh, is now that screw caps have been introduced. Uh, and screw caps uh, allow the white wine to age a little bit slower. Uh, and so it's going to extend out the cellar in life, which is you know really good news, I think. Yeah, that's um, that's really incredible. Um, uh, you know, especially uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. This is unoaked as well, right? Yeah, correct. Yep, yep, totally unoaked. Um, I think the amazing thing about this too is there is, I mean, nine years on now, and I'm still getting a little bit of citrus there. I'm still getting some, you know, a bit of fresh fruit there. And it's just really well underpinned by that honeysuckle that you talked about earlier. Um, it's just such a such an amazing combo. Um, yeah. Jesus is excellent. <laughs> and I think the interesting thing with this wine and the 2010, which we'll taste shortly, is that they're, they're still quite young, you know, and they've got uh, lots of potential left um, to continue to age and age very gracefully. Right, and so um, for those at home that are really into cellaring their wines and, and might be interested in picking up some of this Marsan, um, how long can they expect to keep it in a, in a well-kept cellar, would you think? Well, we have examples that are under cork, of course, um, going back to the 1950s. Uh, two that spring to mind is the 53 and the 59, uh, and they're still drinking beautifully. 
Uh, there's a number through the 60s. Generally, the cooler years through the 60s and the 70s have aged quite well under cork. Um, and in more recent times, since we've been using screw cap, which has been since 2002, all of those wines, every wine under screw cap is aging well and will continue to go on. You know, I think the 2002, for instance, will be at its best probably in another 15 or 20 years' time. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. As I said before, I mean, there's still a really great citrus that's underpinning all of that at the moment. Um, so, uh, you know, can't wait to see what that looks like in, a, in another nine years. Um, all right. Well, let's move on then to the uh, 2010. Now, if you could, Alistair, I'm going to test your memory here a little bit. Um, tell us about how maybe the, could you tell us maybe about how these vintages differed uh, climatically and and how the resulting wine might differ as well. Okay, so you try try the 2010 first, Ryan. Okay. Do that now. Yep. All right. Let's see. And tell me whether you think that this wine, even though it's two years older, is a little bit more restrained than the 2012. Okay. All right. Yes or yes or no answer is good. <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah definitely i still got a little bit more of an austere like um citrus to it yeah. uh might yeah. even be a little bit more acidic than um than the 12 as well so you know that's all the signs yeah. that it's it's aging even better i'd say that's right so 2010 will age better than the 2012 and it's it's seasonally driven so 2010 was a cooler year 2012 was a warm-ish to even hot year. Uh, and so, you, you know, you would expect that in the warmer years, uh, the wines, you know, because they're a bit more complex when they're very young, uh, will just build on that complexity and get to their best quicker. Uh, whereas the cooler years give us the more austere styles, uh, yep. higher natural acidity. And, and so that really backs them in for much longer term cellaring potential, you know, like some of the wines I mentioned in the 50s and the 60s and so on. Yeah, absolutely. There's still definitely you know, a really great element of almost uh, like a lemon sherbet almost there, um, yeah. which is, you know, really holding it all together so beautifully. So, yeah, I, I can't wait to see again how that would look uh, in another 10 years. And the colour yeah. seems to be near identical as well. I might just put these two in front of the camera so that everybody can get a look here. But um you know what i, th I think that, yeah i think they're about the same um yeah. color wise but you can re you can really taste it for those at home um so if you're into cellaring your wines definitely have a look at some of these marsans those are those are crackers those are awesome uh, all right I'll, um, just, I'll just um i'll just give uh, everyone a little tip too around uh, how you predict the cellaring potential of a wine and it's, it's the same rule for reds or whites uh, you, you you do need to have a stock of the wine so hopefully you're drinking a bottle a year and you've got a, a 12 12 or 24 bottles <laughs> sitting in the cellar uh, yep. but uh, as you're tasting it you will taste as it's developing it's when, when it's getting close to its best you know so it's most complex uh, and where everything's softened down and it's just drinking beautifully so at that time, and let's say it could be 20 years, then you would say, okay, it's, I can then confidently predict that it's going to drink at that quality level for at least half that time again. So if it took 20 years to get to its best, it's mm -hmm. going to age for at least another 10 years. And that's a really good rule of thumb, I think, because a lot of people think when a wine gets to its best, that it's going to fall off a cliff and that they need to invite all their mates around and, and quickly have some dinner parties and drink it all. Uh, but it's just yeah. not true. You know, the longer it takes to get to its best, the longer it's going to continue on. Absolutely. Oh, and actually, that's a good point. Why don't we talk about a food match too? So age must end, not something that, you know, people would really typically come across. So it is something a little bit left field. Um, for viewers at home who are really interested in grabbing some of this, what should they be eating with it? Well, either of these two wines, I think, you know, if you were going to drink it tonight, uh, I'd, I'd be looking at some sort of spicy Asian dishes, uh, pork dish, chicken dishes, you know, it'll be all, all over that. Uh, if you're talking fish, uh, and I know with all the troubles we're having with China, you know, lobster's pretty good value at the moment. So yeah. uh, a lobster Mornay with, with one of these wines too, I think would be absolutely delicious. 
Unreal, unreal. All right. Uh, well, why don't we move on to some of the reds then? Um, so uh, let's have a look at the, um, you know what? We'll do the 2010 Shiraz next, I think. So the Eric Stevens um, per brick Shiraz. So I'll just show this to the camera. This no, no, no. Can, Ryan, can we do yeah. the 2009 estate Shiraz first? Because Absolutely. the BSP is a little bit richer. Absolutely. Let's do the 2009 Shiraz, not a problem. So I'll just show this off to the camera. Here we go. So before we start with the reds, perhaps uh, I can give everyone a little bit of background on how we make the wines. Uh, so as I, I mentioned with the whites, we're using all the modern technology that we lay our hands on and talk about flavour retention. With our red wine making, <clears throat> it is the other extreme. Uh, it's all about very old-fashioned, traditional winemaking, uh, and we're using a lot of the original equipment still at to build. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that uh, the grapes start their life in very small open vats. Um, yep. they, uh, they ferment there quite happily for uh, eight to 10 days, and that's where we extract all the flavour, the colour, uh, and the acidity and the tannins that we require. Uh, mm -hmm. And we, we achieve that just by simply turning over the fermented juice onto the top of the skins twice a day for 20 minutes and letting it gently percolate through and leach out uh, all of those component flavours. Uh, after that eight to 10 days, right. then we pump it downstairs into a mixture of old and new oak. Uh, all the oak, whether it's Cabernet mm -hmm. or Shiraz, is French oak. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's generally, for, for this wine, uh, it would be around 30% new French oak uh, and the rest of it or the balance old oak. And when I talk about old oak, right. I mean century old plus barrels, very old oak. So you don't get any other wow. flavour from that, but you do get that the maturation that occurs over 18 to 20 months, which is yep. the complexing of those raw fruit flavours into much more complex flavours, which is what you want before you bottle it. Excellent. Almost just like a fine wine that matures over time, just like oak as well, right? Yeah. Um, so the the other thing about our red wines is that because it's all estate grown, we want the fruit to be the hero. We want the fruit to make the statement. Um, yep. And so I sort of describe it like we've got a, a fruit umbrella mm -hmm. and then underneath that supporting the fruit is a little bit of tannin and perhaps a little bit of new oak but they should be neatly wrapped underneath and absolutely absorbed under the fruit umbrella um, so that uh, the fruit then makes the star. The fruit's the star of the show, not the wine making, oh. right? All right, let's have a look. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm already smelling some really amazing savoury characters there. And also, yeah. I don't know if you can well, see this in the last two, but... Are getting a little bit of maturation. We are getting that little bit of a mauve character too. There, a bit of a mauve colour, but it looks to be holding up really, really, really well. Well, the other, the other thing that everyone should know is that we're not making big, masculine blockbuster Shiraz like Barossa Valley or McLaren Vale. Uh, ours is more on the cooler climate, elegant end of the scale. So I describe these wines as mid-weight. Uh, it still doesn't mean that they can't be sell it with confidence, but but they are very different in style to what South Australia makes. Um, and because of uh, the cooler climate, we get very different flavour components as well. So the savouriness mm -hmm. that you mentioned, Ryan, is due to the soil type, um, yep. but the fruit flavours that you'll see are hopefully around the spices, um, the black peppers, maybe some white peppers, uh, mm -hmm. and the red, red berry fruits. Mm, yep, that's incredible. Give it another try. Absolutely. To what you said earlier as well, you know, it is more of a um, of a delicate style of Shiraz, um, a little bit much different to, you know, the Barossa style. It doesn't quite have that same uh, weight that a Barossa style might, but um, the, the tannins are just so well integrated as well. They're not in your face. They're not, you know, knocking you around left, right and centre, but they're there um, and they really back up the fruit just perfectly as well. 
Um, I think, you know, as you said earlier, you know, the fruit's the star of the show and, and I think it shows in this wine for sure. Yeah, and, and I think the good thing is, as it's presenting to me tonight, uh, it's as a uh, 12-year-old red wine, uh, yep. it's, it's Crazy. got lovely fresh fruit flavours that are there uh, and, uh, and now we've got a little bit of bottle age complexity mm -hmm. coming in as well, uh, but still with elegance. You know, I call it elegance with power and, uh, and it, it will continue to age and age beautifully um, for, you know, the next 10 or 15 years. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that is really incredible. Uh, all right. Well, why don't we then tuck into the next one? So um, this is the Eric Stevens Purbrick 2010 Shiraz. We'll get a close up of that for the camera. Take a look at that. All right. Now, obviously, this is named after, you know, an Eric Stevens Purbrick. So um, give us a little bit of a story about, um, you know, the, the origins of this wine and, and why you've named it after Eric. Formerly was called our bin series. Uh, and the background to that bin series is that just immediately after the Second World War finished, my grandfather decided that he wanted to release his first flagship wine, you know, his first mm -hmm. super premium. And uh, he decided, as he did in future years after this first release, uh, to pick the best bat It was in the winery, and mm -hmm. that was what was bottled, and that became the bin wine. So his first flagship release of this lineage was with the 1948 uh, bin 11 Shiraz, uh, mm -hmm. and we've still got some of that wine, and it's still drinking beautifully, I must say. Uh, so he chose well. <laughs> Uh, yep. And then he, he continued on uh, with that bin series and he just picked the best vat. So sometimes it was a Cabernet Sauvignon, sometimes it was a Cabernet Shiraz, Shiraz Cabernet or, or a Shiraz. Mm -hmm. So we continued on with that right through uh, until 1985 when mm -hmm. I uh, made probably one of the stupidest decisions of my life uh, in that I decided that, you know, calling a wine a bin was a bit ho-hum, so why don't yep. we use magnificent word called yep. reserve <laughs> absolutely so, which had some cachet back in the 80s but yeah yeah it was it, new back then yeah <laughs> through the rest of the 80s and the 90s um yep. that word reserve you know was bastardized to a very large degree uh and was meaningless when you had reserve wines coming out at less than five dollars retail and so on so so yep. we yep. started to cast or put our minds to what we could call this lineage uh, which would be quintessentially to build, which which wouldn't need to be changed again. And it sort of fell out pretty easily, uh, you know, a bit like Eileen Hardy for the Hardy label. Uh, that, yep. You know, Eric's first wine, it was the 1948 that he instigated this lineage. Why wouldn't we call it after him and in his honour? So uh, everyone calls it the ESP, but it's, it is the Eric Stevens Purbrick um, Shiraz. Uh, yep. And we, we picked the best Shiraz. Um, so we still follow his philosophy. Uh, so the best vats of Shiraz, uh, blend mm -hmm. them up, and then um, that becomes the wine. So uh, with this wine, the 2010, I hope you're seeing, again, 2010, remember, was a cool year. So mm -hmm. it's a real lift up in intensity of flavour. And because we've got a more intense fruit halo um, to work with, uh, we were able to put in a little bit more tannin, uh, and a little bit more new oak. So we're probably up to around 40% new French oak for this wine, but you would never know. It just soaks it up. Um, and uh, then you're still going to get the same flavours as mm -hmm. you saw with the 2009, but they're more intense. So more yep. intense spices, yep. more intense uh, black peppers, red berry fruits, and that savouriness still comes through. Absolutely. It's already jumping out of the glass on me. I can smell it from back here. Um, all right. <clears throat> mm. In, incidentally, we've got another Shiraz that sits a price point or two above this particular wine, which is a single vineyard uh, wine made from fruit grown on our 1860 planted Shiraz block, and mm -hmm. and we did a vertical tasting of of that particular lineage uh, uh, about five years ago, and the 2010 of the 1860 vines, Shiraz, 
came out to be one of the best three wines of the 29 wines tasted. So in other words, 2010 is a really good year. Yeah, it's almost like the 2009, the one that we just tried on steroids pretty much, you know. Yeah. Um, the fruit is just so powerful and I'm getting some of that, you know, a lot more of that pepper, that black pepper mostly, a bit of white pepper too, but the, the fruit is just jumping around in my mouth this is really incredible and now you said as well you only you only make this with a single vat um so obviously this is a very limited release so how how, how much are we talking here i mean you know for viewers at home that you know just to kind of give them a bit of insight into how rare these wines are or how limited they might be you know i feel like it'd be really hard for them to find this stuff uh mm. around the bottle shop so uh you know what are we talking about in terms of how much you guys are making yeah, so it varies a lot uh, from year to year, depending on the vat sizes. Yep. Uh, but it could be, uh, it wouldn't be any less than 250 dozen, which is a very small number. Mm -hmm. And it could be as much as 750 dozen, which mm -hmm. again, is not a very big release. So, mm -hmm. so yes, it is very hard to get and hard to find uh, because of its rarity. Yeah, that is seriously, seriously good, you know. Again, as I said before, you know, very different to the Barossa style. Um, you know, as you mentioned, elegance with power, I think, sums it up beautifully. You know, it's not this wet blanket sometimes that you get in your mouth when you drink Barossa Shiraz. It's really, really well layered. Um, excellent. Can't wait to take that home tonight. Um, okay, cool. All right. So uh, why don't we then have a look at some Cabernet, I think. Um, okay, well, let's do the same again. So let's start yep. with the 2009. Sure. The camera. Okay, so a, a little bit of background on the winemaking, which won't take very long because it's pretty similar. Uh, so we're using the same red winemaking philosophy, open vats, and a combination of new French oak with uh, older oak maturation, uh, yep. and, uh, and, and for the same time in oak, which is 18 to 20 months. So the, the, the only difference really with, between Cabernet Sauvignon and Shiraz is the fact that the Cabernet Sauvignon obviously has different fruit flavours, but mm -hmm. our to build Cabernet Sauvignon has actually never been 100% to build, well, 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, yep. It's the original Cabernet planted vineyard, which was planted in 1949, as it turns out, has about 10% Cabernet Franc spread amongst the Cabernet Sauvignon. So grandfather and my father, when they decided to plant more Cabernet, mm -hmm. would plant a portion of Cabernet Franc that represented about 10%. Uh, not, right. in, not in the Cabernet Sauvignon, but next to it. Um, yep. so, so they continued with that tradition because they felt that they'd set up a lineage of Cabernet Sauvignon that actually was a blend. Mm -hmm. uh, then I decided to plant uh, some Merlot uh, yep. in 19... 90 and I felt that the Merlot could actually really add some middle palate value to Cabernet Sauvignon, which sometimes can yep. be a little bit hollow. Yep. So as of the 2000 vintage, there's about 5% Merlot in it. So now uh, as of 2000 vintage and onwards, it's 85% Cabernet Sauvignon, 10% Cabernet Franc and about 5% mm -hmm. Merlot. Um, so you're getting right. also right. nuances of flavour from those other varieties as well. Right. Flavour-wise, I hope. Flavour-wise, I hope what you're seeing is uh, lots of mint. Don't smell. Um, dark berry fruits, um, and dominantly, it's it's mulberry and blackberry that will come through. Um, some savoury notes from the soil type, not as obvious as with the Shiraz, but it's always yeah. it's always there. And a few vanilla notes as well, which actually yeah. isn't oak. It's actually a natural fruit flavour. Um, so that all sort of wraps around. Then you get um, some violets from Cabernet Franc. Um, and, and a little bit of sort of, uh, oh, I'd call it like um, Christmas pudding type flavours from the Merlot. But, you know, yep. at 5%, it's pretty subdued. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, you can tell it's got a really rich, dark smell to it as well. Um, a lot of black fruits there for sure. Um, and again, I mean, we're talking about 2009 Cabernet here. Um, so, you know, not a, not nearly as much tertiary and secondary flavours as I thought, you know, you might you might expect. So... Have a try. Mm. Mm. 
Wow. It tastes almost brand new, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> there is definitely those secondary characters underlying it and so, like, a little bit of what you said, you know, that Christmas pudding, um, some you know, a bit of stewed fruit in there too. But, um, you know, the Merlot, I feel like, really well uh, rounds that out on the palate. Um, and it's it's just beautiful black dark fruits. Um, that's excellent. And, and and Alistair as well for the viewers at home. How might that differ, say, from uh, you know Kunawara Cabernet that people are typically purchasing, uh, or, or is maybe more of a famous region for Cabernet? Mm. Yeah, actually, I think that that's 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 a very good point, Ryan. Uh, when we're talking Cabernet Sauvignon in Australia there are a very small number of regions that can do it and do it really well you know, to world-class yeah. standards. Whereas Shiraz, we can do different Shiraz, diversity of Shiraz styles from probably 40 of our 60 odd regions around Australia. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're just very different in style. So uh, so obviously, you know, Kunawara and Margaret River would be our two best known Cabernet Sauvignon regions. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's a number of others, I think, that do it really well. You know, I think the mm -hmm. Yarra Valley, in Victoria does it well, Claire does it really well, uh, and I'd like to think that here at Nagambi Lakes we do it very well also. Um, yeah, but but it's a small <laughs> number. You know, we could probably get up to maybe eight or ten regions and we'd be struggling yeah. to, to get yeah. past that. Yeah. And, hey, for the viewers at home uh, who, again, are really into selling their wines, I mean, this feels like this has got legs on it, you know. I feel like this can this can sit down for a really long time. Uh, how, how long can viewers at home expect to keep this one in the cellar? Well, I, I think in any given year, whether it's the Estate Shiraz and Cabernet or whether it's the ESP Shiraz and Cabernet, uh, you can add 10 to 15 years onto the cellar and potential of the Cabernet Sauvignon compared to the Shiraz. Um, so it's, it's just the nature of the grape. It's a very small berry. The tannins uh, help put it all together and it's got a much uh, higher natural acidity as well. So it's sort of got all those extra natural components that are going to see it, uh, you know, stay stay the course and, and do very well and, and mature into wonderful wine. Absolutely. All right. Fantastic. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move on to the Eric Stevens Purbrick 2010 Cabernet Sauvignon. So I, I warn everyone uh, before they try this wine, um, that this is, you know, the biggest and richest style we make. It's still mid-weight, but only just falling into mid-weight, uh, but it packs a punch. <laughs> and out of 2010 being a cooler year, uh, it really packs a double punch. Uh, so it's going to be similar to what we're talking about with the 2009 Estate Cabernet. Uh, yep. It's just, it's just uh, a steroid version of, <laughs> of the Estate, you yeah. So, Absolutely. Anyway. I'm scared now because you know what? I thought that 2009 was just bursting with flavour. So um, we'll see how this one goes. Let's have a try. Yeah. See, what, see what you think. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's incredible how much flavor that really packs. Again, it almost catches you off guard because it doesn't quite have the body that you might expect from some of those South Australian styles. But gee whiz, that is a really, really flavorful wine. Um, yeah. I feel like the tannins are integrated just absolutely perfectly. Again, not too in your face. It's all about the fruit again, but definitely just you know a touch more powerful, say, than the 2009. Um, but yeah, you weren't you weren't wrong. You weren't kidding. That that really does pack a punch. That's excellent. Yeah, and so the you, you see the mint flavours, you know, uh, coming out very clearly in that particular wine. And it's unusual to see the mint flavours in Kudawara or Margaret River. Uh, so they're more what I call the tea leaf. Um, even you know, if I use a European term, cigar box type flavours. Uh, yep. Whereas uh, our, our 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 sort of uh, stamp is around the mint flavours. Uh, they, they do get the mint flavours, particularly in Kudawara, in the cooler years. Uh, yep. And you might remember there was a famous wine from made by Mildara, the 1962 uh, mm -hmm. uh, peppermint patty. 
uh, and that was just a pep, a, you know, a peppermint or pepper uh, yep. mint bomb. Yeah. Um, so yep. they can they can get the flavours down there, but it's more unusual. Whereas we get them year in year out. Yeah, absolutely. For the viewers at home, not so much of that mint and eucalyptus that, that you typically see from some of those other regions. But gee whiz, it's it's more of, you know again black fruits and pepper, and that is just mm -hmm. sensational. That's really incredible. Um, wow. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now, um, Alistair, if it's all right with you, I think we might move on to a few questions. We've got quite a lot of questions. It looks like from the viewers. Um, you got time to answer a few questions? Yeah, far away. All right, let's stop from the top. Okay, let's have a look here. Uh, so Andrew Graham has said, what has changed over the time with the Marsan winemaking? From when you started to now. Have we still got you? Yeah, yeah, we just froze up for a little while, but I'm back, I think. So what's what's changed over time with the Marsan winemaking, I think was the question. Yeah, absolutely, yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Marsan before my time, I mentioned that I started in 1978, my first vintage was 1979, and uh, what my father charged me with in that interim period running up to the vintage of 79 was to build a new white wine fermentation cellar that had as much modern equipment as was available at the day, on the day, uh, or back in those days. Um, yep. So it did mean we got refrigeration, we got stainless steel, uh, we got some rudimentary presses, tank presses and so on. Um, so prior to my first vintage in 1979, mm -hmm. grandfather was making Marsan using traditional red wine making techniques, which yeah, right. for yeah. the most part wasn't great. Uh, and unless he picked them early, <laughs> Uh, it, yeah, was, yeah. it, it wasn't going to be really good. Um, and those wines I was talking about, the 1953, the 59, uh, some of the wines in the 60s and 70s, were all wines from cool years that he picked early, so it had great natural acidity and terrific flavour. So even making them using oxidative techniques still didn't get rid of all the fruit, <laughs> if, if yeah, that makes right. sense. Yeah, uh, yeah, whereas yeah, from 1979, <laughs> 1979 and onwards, uh, I yep. was making them as we still make them now, but with better equipment now. Uh, and so we retain all of those aromatics. So the wines from 79 and onwards are obviously much better um, yep. than in the past. Uh, and they'll be much more consistent and yep. they'll consistently have cellaring ability. Right. So since 79, right. say you've tried to really stay true to, to kind of, you know, you set the, the benchmark there and you've kind of uh, tried to stay true to that. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're happy yep. with... Yes. Yep. Excellent. All right, cool. Um, next question. This is a good one. So from Luke Wilson, um, he said, it seems Nagambi has quite a different climate to the Yarra Valley, which is obviously, you know, uh, not, not so far away. Um, so could you maybe give us a bit of insight into how um, uh, Nagambi differs, say, from the Yarra Valley or even, you know, Heathcote as well? Well, we, we've talked about Ngambi Lakes and the fact that uh, it's quite unique because mm -hmm. it gets cooled by the water mass that's around it. Uh, and to, I guess to put that into context for the viewers, that's similar to a maritime effect. Um, so uh, for, from that, that perspective, our measurement of climate, which is used, a term used is called degree days, which I won't bother trying to explain to everyone. Uh, but yeah. essentially, our degree days here at Nagambi Lakes are identical to Mornington Peninsula, uh, which is a lot further south of us. So that, that just shows you the effect, the dramatic effect that the water mass has. Uh, and, you know, Yarra Valley uh, is, is different. It doesn't have the maritime effect. Uh, it does have yeah. uh, higher hills where they can get some cool climate fruit. They've got the yep. valley floor where it's a little bit warmer, you know. So, so they you get a variety of styles out of the Yarra Valley. Uh, you mm -hmm. can get great Pinot Noir or, um, and sparkling base running all the way through to you know terrific Cabernet Sauvignon uh, and Chardonnay. Excellent, unreal. Okay, nice. 
Um, moving on, I've got one here as well from Mr. Paul Chad. Uh, he says that he has a bottle of the Tar Bilk Marsan 1990 and 1992. Uh, he wants to know if he should open them soon or keep them for a few more years. What do you think, Alistair? Okay, so both of those wines are bottled with cork closure. Uh, yep. Both of those wines uh, are drinking uh, pretty much at their best, or in the case of the 1990, maybe a little bit past its best. So mm -hmm. as long as the cork has held up and there's no cork tight issues, then uh, I'd say you know, drink both up on a, on a special occasion that might be coming around the corner soon, uh, but drink the 1990 first because that's more advanced than the 92. The 92 is drinking magnificently. Right, excellent. Right. All right, beautiful. Um, now, Alistair, it's gone, it's gone by very quickly, but we've actually reached 48 minutes, so a little bit longer than we would have thought. But, uh, look, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you today. Uh, I feel like we've learned so much about Nagambi and the rich history of Tarbilk uh, and these incredible wines as well. Um, now, for the viewers at home, the wines that we're actually tr uh, been trying today, we are offering uh, as a once off six pack as you can imagine wines this old there's not a ton of them lying around so it's not like we can just get more um so they are on offer on our website today we will be keeping those up for about a week's time or until they sell out so probably won't last that long um so uh, there should be a link in the chat for you guys if you want to jump on those and put those in your cellar um also, uh, we're actually doing a promotion today, as I said earlier, as a thank you for joining us and sticking around to the end. Um, use code TARBILK25 uh, on any order uh, before midnight tonight to get $25 off your order. That's TARBILK25, T-A-H-B-I-L-K 25 for $25 off your order. Uh, ends midnight tonight um so don't don't miss out on that one um also as one more quick sign off too being the last day of the biggest week in wine uh we're actually offering double points on every single wine we have on offer on the website so uh you know we don't do this very often um but it's one of our uh better promotions by a long stretch people love it i'm going to be going home and ordering a case of this myself tonight and using the promo code getting double points it's an absolute bargain don't miss out. We're basically giving away money here, guys. Um, but, yeah, look, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, Alistair, thank you so much for joining us. Hope to have you again soon. Uh, and, everybody, have a great night. Yeah. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, mate. Cheers.